Church of the Desert. My name is Joni Paddock, and I will be your worship associate for today. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome Peter Matthews back, a good, dear friend of UCOD. And his husband, Hiroshi, is around here so... Oh, you're right there. I saw you over there. <laughs> okay. Before we begin, if you could take out your cell phones and make sure they're on silent or any other devices that you might have brought with you. Here, as we do every week, we acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded lands of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla people, and we commit to grow in our understanding and relationship with this land and with the people who inhabited it, excuse me, and nurtured it before our arrival. In this congregation where we strive to honor the inherent worth and dignity of every person, you are welcome here no matter your sexual orientation or gender identity, your age, your size, whether you're rich or poor. We welcome people of all races, religions, and cultures. We welcome you wherever you come from, whoever you love. We welcome all those who will learn and grow with us as we, as we commit to embrace the rich and beautiful diversity of the world. Our goal here is to build a community centered in justice, in compassion, and in love. We're glad that you're with us this morning, whether you are here in the sanctuary or at home joining us on the stream. We're very grateful for your presence. To learn more about us or the, the programming that we offer, please contact Pam in our office. Her email address is admin at uucod.org. And now please join us as Peter rings our Tibetan bowl and we listen to the wonderful Joel Baker play our music for centering. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for this opportunity. I've never spent more time in my life, I'm serious about this, preparing for something. But I didn't really have a choice. I don't know if it's because of the addiction to thought, which is supposed to be the most pervasive addiction that exists, and I have it tenfold. Uh, but uh, what an opportunity for growth. And when I got a little nervous about speaking today, I thought, it doesn't matter. I, I got 99% of what I needed. Uh, and I don't mean to sound selfish, uh, but it's been wonderful. And it was this opportunity that brought that up. So anyway, that is not the call to worship. I just love the sound <laughs> of my own voice. Um, <laughs> The first time I flew in a plane, I was 19 years old, I uh, flew out of Syracuse, New York, and perhaps I didn't know that I had uh, projected uh, something onto the clouds. It's the second cloudiest city in the United States, so I was used to living in blizzard, rain, darkness, November 1st, big black curtain would come down and the, and the whole state would get depressed. Uh, <laughs> And then I flew. It was overwhelming, just like the last two months have been. It was truly overwhelming. What I didn't know is I didn't know that you, you existed. I didn't know transcendentalism existed. I didn't know that every holy book that exists says the reality is not here. It's in the ideal. The crack is the ideal. I have, I can't show you, or some people may not hear me, I have an ink problem, it spilled out of a pen in my pants, I discovered it yesterday, said, oh, I have to go out and shop and buy a pair of pants. Here's how much I've grown, and I love it. I don't care if I'm doing this. I saw it this morning, and it's in shape of a smile. Need I say more? We went, we went through the clouds, the Syracuse clouds, that's all I've ever known. Black, dark, pretty much. I mean, the sun did shine occasionally in <laughs> Syracuse, sometimes an average of 53 days a year. We hit the clouds, but we didn't hit the clouds because there's nothing there, as you know. You've heard this metaphor before. There's nothing there. It's vapor. 
And what's been so wonderful the last two, three years of my life is that I think for me, all of those clouds have been just vapor. All of them. And I've had some suffering, as we all have, and I love that too, because it's, that's where the reality lies, is in the suffering. And when I find the reality, it's always gorgeous for me the last couple of, of years. So I'm either incredibly deluded, which I may be, <laughs> I don't care, because I'm just obsessed now with finding the reality, the real reality. Anyway, this is not, this isn't it either. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So we got through the clouds, I'll speed up a bit, and discovered as you would anticipate, it is infinite. There is nothing above the clouds but sun, warmth, beauty, nothing. That isn't a delusion. It really isn't. That is the reality, and that's what the transcendentalists taught, our, our supposed saints, even if a couple of them own slaves, I guess. So, here's what I'd like to worship this morning. This is the point. Is let's, for a moment, or for an hour, worship reality. Because it's the ideal. It's the perfect. In fact, the Buddhists say, it's nirvana. Our opening words this morning come from Thich Nhat Hanh. <coughs> Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become holy ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being, common to all of us and all living things. Evoking the presence of the great compassion, let us fill our hearts with our own compassion towards ourself and towards all living beings. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be the cause of suffering to each other. With humility, with awareness of the existence of life and of the suffering that are going on around us, let us practice the establishment of peace in our hearts and on earth. And now I would like to ask Hiroshi to come up and if you could please join us with the chalice laying words that will be up on the screen. May love be the spirit of this church. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. And now Hiroshi will also light the Biopark candles. We light these candles in solidarity with black, indigenous, and other people of color as we journey together towards spiritual wholeness. May we, as a beloved community, work to dismantle racism and all forms of oppression. May we live out our principles so that justice Actually, that was perfect. I've always wanted to sit on a lot of money for a while. <laughs> a story for all ages. A little girl, about seven or eight, we all aspire to be little girls, men and women alike, aspire, dream of being a little girl. That's it. The little girl was playing in a room. She was very good about entertaining herself. She loved puzzles. But she still was anxious for dad to come home from work and play with her. And he did, about 6.30, later than usual. He was exhausted, and all he could hope to do was read the paper and drink a beer or whatever. And she ran out of her room because she loved her daddy, and he loved her. And uh, they hugged, and she said, Daddy, Daddy, please, please play with me. 
He was torn, of course, for obvious reason. He had the paper already open, and there was a full-page ad uh, of an airline's with, uh, it might have been American, it doesn't, doesn't matter, of course, with a picture of the earth, the globe, with the, with the plane across it. And he thought, Father, how, you know, how do I meet this dilemma of mine? I love my daughter, but I need some rest. So he tore up the ad. He suddenly got this idea, I'm going to tear up the ad into 100, 200, 300 pieces. Next to him just happened to be a bowl and some scotch tape. And he handed all the pieces to his daughter and said, Sweetheart, why don't you go to your room, put the puzzle together, you love puzzles, and come back when you're done. Expecting he had at least two hours, she was back in 10 minutes. And he said, my God, at that point all was transcended. The reality was he was incredibly impressed with his daughter's brilliance. Because that was the reality. And so he asked her, he said, how in, well, he was going to say hell, but he thought that was inappropriate, which I may be today. But he loved her, and I love you. And he said, how the heck did you do that? And, and she said, Daddy, there was an ad on the flip side of the page. This is probably an old one for most of you, or many of you. Um, and, and she said, I, there was an ad, it was a big picture of a little girl, maybe for JCPenney clothing or something, and all I had to do was put the little girl together and the world took care of itself. I love that story. Thank you, Peter. I'm just going to read a little Joys and Sorrows prayer. Spirit of life, you who animate the universe, help us remember that the, the gift that is a human life. With our consciousness and senses, we can touch, taste, see, and feel so much that is good and alluring and enticing. Spirit of life, some of us here today may be thinking of concerns more than joys of loss rather than enjoyment. For those of us, we ask for healing and restoration. To those of us, we pledge our aid. Just as cares arise, so shall they pass. Just as grief pains, new joy beckons. Spirit of life, may we rem remember that life is a dance, and may we ensure that we move to the rhythm divine. So may it be. Amen. A question uh, might arise, if this isn't the reality, then, then what is? I, I think you all maybe know the answer. I'm just finally really figuring it out. One of them is that we confuse the past with the present. It's normal, it's natural, perhaps there's even something very positive about it. William Faulkner, and I'm sure people before him, were often credited with saying, the past is the present. Then the reality is lost. The reality is not out there. Another thing to remember that the reality out there is not, um, I mean, how do you look at Gaza or anywhere else and think, but my pain has always been in here, the delusion versus the reality in here. If I can eliminate the delusion, I'm left with the reality, and the reality is always, for me lately, gorgeous. If you would drop your eyes or close your eyes just for a moment, Let's take care of just that particular obstacle, I guess you could call it, or challenge. 
in a moment, take a couple of breaths. But as you do, one thing that might help is as you breathe in, you could say to yourself, I have arrived. And as you breathe out, you could say to yourself, I am home, as you let your body relax. Please try to hold on to the following image as much as you can. You're sitting on a bench, just a concrete plain bench in front of a pond, a small pond. Surrounding the pond are all sorts of beautiful flowering plants of all the colors that you love and choose, of all the plants that you love and choose. There's a waterfall at the end, at the other side of the pond. You can't see where the waterfall hits, it, it flows down. There's a basket in the pond, and that basket is slowly heading toward the falls. Imagine that. There's no hurry. In the basket is every, what we normally define is every pain and every suffering. I'm having trouble these days seeing it that way, but nonetheless, we all suffer. And slowly, in your own time, watch the basket full of suffering, pain, bad experiences, go over the falls. There's another basket with all your successes, all your failures, as we tend to, in my opinion, arbitrarily, maybe falsely assign them. But nonetheless, everything in the past is in the basket, and that too, in your own time, goes over the falls. Now imagine a third basket. It is not in the pond. The basket is down. You're still seated. It is down by your right foot. It's a large basket, an open basket, like one you might bring wood in to the hearth. And it's empty. If you haven't stood up already, Stand up, reach down, or reach down first, and pick up the empty basket. We have this power as much as we can hang on to it. It is an empty basket now, and we're old enough now to choose to put anything we want in that basket. It will be now, and it will be real, and it will be gorgeous. At any time you'd like to open your eyes, we will now stand as you are ready and able for our hymn for meditation.
The actual title of today came from an Alan Watts video I saw. Reality is gorgeous. Other than the past sneaking into the present and, cause, and causing us to believe something that isn't true, there are, of course, numerous other things that play a role in that that, that, we, that, we all, that we all really know. Our human education, to put it all in one basket, school, parents, neighbors, friends, uh, churches, have taught us a lot of beautiful things, no question about it. And in my opinion, with good intentions, taught us or spread on a lot of misinformation, of course, and we all know that. I think, and it doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong for me, heaven on earth, thy kingdom come, my kingdom come, nirvana, all mean reality. Dissonance. We all experience dissonance, and now we're watching it play out in a world we can't even comprehend. You're fighting for the right of the unborn at the cost of many more dying that are alive. That's what I call dissonance, I guess. But I have it too, not that particular one. But I'm getting to have an understanding of dissonance. One of my favorite novels is Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I thought it was brilliant, Twain, how he captured this. So one, one scene is, is Huck is with Jim. He's helped Jim escape. Not because Huck thought that was the right thing to do. He didn't know any better than to do the right thing. And at one point, they're sitting by the fire, and he, uh, Huck says to Jim, Let's go get your children who were taken by the slave owners. And Jim says, I can't do that, Huck. And Huck says, why not? And he says, it's wrong. It's against the law. And Huck is like, okay. Okay. You must be right, Huck says. He doesn't say this in the novel, but I think this is what Twain is saying. Uh, you're right, Jim, I must be wrong. I must be wrong. You're right, that, that's the law. That's what everybody does. And I know you're a good person, Jim, because he is a good person. And of course, we can go on and on about that novel if you've ever read it or, or, or studied it. There's the, there's the women who take Huck in. They go to church, they educate him, they clothe him. They are the very definition of beautiful people who own a slave, right? And that one most people don't miss when they uh, read or study that, that novel. Some of this stuff has helped me to understand what's going on and get me closer to reality. Therefore, the conflict in me between delusion and reality, that the world should be this way, is tempered when I find the reality. And then I'm not suffering as much. In fact, sometimes when I take it farther and farther and farther, what if the apocalypse is coming? Now, believe me, I wouldn't take this smoothly. <laughs> I wouldn't you know, sit there and say, oh, I'm a positive thinker. Uh, but who knows? A grand birth? Maybe it has to come to an end? Nothing more frightening to me than a Trump dynasty for decades. Is that possible? Yes. There are people out there who study it that say it's even probable. People who I pay attention to anyway. Huck doesn't know that he's morally evolved. People who are morally evolved don't usually know it. So they don't usually run for office either. Another issue I think that keeps us from knowing reality is this business of who we are, our identity. Uh, that's it. 
That's it, the flame, that is it. It's the greatest symbol that any church could ever create. That is us, that's it. I got in a discussion, or my students actually brought it up in class one day years ago, and said, you know, the kid said, who, who am I? How do we determine this? I thought quickly enough that day, I don't know how much of an impression it had, but I walked over to an open window that we had. We weren't supposed to open it because you could fall out and we were on the third floor. Um, but I intentionally, without saying anything, I intentionally sat where it looked a little precarious. Like if a huge wind came up, I might go. So then I asked the kids to close their eyes, like I did with you earlier, took a moment, said, now imagine you're all sitting within arm's length of me. And then I continued to ask them to imagine that they hated me. That maybe there was a moment they got a bad grade, they wanted me dead. And even if they never had one of those moments, try, like a good actor, to imagine there's a moment. Uh, I forget what they call that kind of acting now. Method acting. Uh, imagine a teacher you did hate for a moment and try to impose that on me. They didn't know it was coming, I don't think. And then, in my great acting ability, I pretended I was falling very quickly. Ah! I asked them to keep their eyes closed. Some opened them when I screamed, of course, understandably so. I asked them to close their eyes again if they had them open and to just sit there. Just sit, relax, get present. Then I asked them to write down, assuming they could get a hold of any thought that they had to write it down. I'm sure many weren't able to do that. It was almost 100% First thought for many students was that they would grab my ankles. The second thought for many students was either, yeah, let them go, <laughs> or I don't know, Mr. Matthews, or I don't care. But they had a second thought. That's the thought that counts, right? We always learn that. They had a second thought to grab my ankle. And there was only one boy that said, I really, Mr. Matthews, I don't have anything against you, but I don't know. I didn't have any thought. I'm not sure I care. <laughs> he was only 14. He didn't know that he cares. He made a false conclusion that he didn't uh, care. That wasn't reality. I'm assuming I could be wrong, but I'm assuming he would fly at my ankle, too, and grab it. We're not all capable of killing somebody. We're not. I would imagine most, if not all, the people in the room are absolutely incapable of killing someone. And that's a reality. These are none of my notes, by the way. Um, and I rewrote this I don't know how many times. It's much better without notes for me, anyway. Language, the limitations of language, connotation. Oh, my goodness. Jealousy. Just one of a million examples I was told all my life, get rid of that. Stop that. I'm human. I always dreamed of being human. I used to want to be perfect so you'd love me, and then I realized that it was the opposite, that there is a crack in everything. And that's what makes me and you worthy of other people loving you. And I lost my train of thought, which was my greatest fear for today. But there's a bigger fear that I'm going to run over time. So, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. I have lots of pages. Jealousy is where I was, right? As soon as I stop thinking, it's our thinking that gets in the way of thinking every time, right? When I get jealous, it always, 100% of the time, brings me to a reality that's gorgeous, that's totally releasing of any conflict in me. Then I'm left with no suffering. Here's what happens when I get jealous, because now I do this automatically. The first thought is, oh, I shouldn't be jealous. That's bad. That's sinful. 
Then the second thought is, what are you jealous of, Peter? This is invariably the case. I would say 80% of the time, boy, that gentleman has, I've actually done this one literally, has a beautiful shirt on. I wish I had his taste. I wish I liked shopping. Oh, I have the same exact shirt on. This is what happens to me. Now, maybe I am kooky. Maybe you can't relate to this at all. But what a lovely awakening. Then the narrative that says, I'm not a shopper. I don't have much fashion. Hiroshi has all the taste. All that non-reality is blown out. So I discover constantly, constantly beautiful things about myself. And I don't care if I'm deluded. I got a call about a year ago from a friend. I had a bunch of friends when I was in middle school and high school, a little bit into college. And that was uh, Jim who called me. I had not spoken to any of them in over 45 years. I had no idea where their lives went. And so he, he did find out, and he reported to me where their lives went. And Jack, one of the buddies, became the CEO of Goodyear. I went, holy, boy, did I get jealous. <laughs> boy, did I get jealous. I am, and then the narrative started. I was a failure. Jack was successful. Jack was a bully, actually. Maybe that's helped him a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. He didn't hurt anybody too badly. <laughs> then I realized I didn't want to study rubber. I didn't want to lead thousands of people. I didn't want to hire and fire. I didn't want to worry about the stocks. I didn't, he owned, I guess he owns three or four homes now, is what I was told, all on the oceans. Well, there's only one ocean, right? That's the reality. There's only one continent. Arbitrariness is another thing that interferes with what's real and what's not real. There is no America. I have never wanted this may not rub with you well, to fly the American flag. I'll fly a flag of the world, but I have never wanted to fly the American flag. Not because I don't love America, because it's not America, it's just a name. How arbitrary is that? Talk to a psychiatrist about lonely. Well, we've got it figured out. There's a difference between solitude and this and that. Do you know that sometimes a chemical reaction in your head, a neurological reaction in your head, makes one feel something uncomfortable, and we take the word loneliness and assign it to it? Period. It has nothing to do with a reality of loneliness. Unconscious bias. Just three min months ago, I did it again, and I'll do this until I go to my grave. There was a young black man driving by in a $300,000 car, and I went right to drug dealer. <laughs> went right there. I don't care anymore. I didn't put that there. That was my human education. I didn't put that there. It's not my identity. That's my identity. That's it. It's not black. It's not white. It's not gay. It's not straight. I hope I don't offend anybody by this. Measure me by, by, by my, my intentions and not impact in this case. There was a woman that was part of this congregation. And she was present at a meeting. I don't know if that was DIB, a meeting, diversity, inclusion, belonging. And she said to my husband, I've always thought of you as white. She received a number of phone calls. She felt she was being attacked. And I understand this. The fervor of the people in Dib and, 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 and all of you people is tremendous. And overzealousness, how do we know? How do we know when we've become overzealous? Well, this congregant called me because she thought that she just offended the heck out of my husband, and she was extremely upset because she was basically told, you know, you got to look at impact here. You got to look at impact, and that's a real good thing to look at. And 
Interestingly enough, she is Huck Finn. Because she, this particular woman is one of the most open-minded, inclusive people you will ever meet in your life. But she didn't know that. So she was hurt because she didn't know that. I just listened. I, I don't think at the time I could have been as clear as maybe I am now, hopefully, am now. Uh, the people who were criticizing her, of course, were in good, had good intentions, and they were excited. They just, I guess, were learning things and studying things because everybody in this room wants to help change the world. And that's a good thing. Don't stop. Have a goal. But know that Mark Twain, do you know why he named himself that? This is one theory anyway, but I, it sounds good to me. Mark Twain named himself Mark Twain because he believed the Twain will never meet. So the people who criticized this, this congregant, they were innocent. And so was the congregant, totally innocent. And there was no way that was going to be patched up. The twain shall never meet. So you might ask, well, then what does Mark mean? Well, he was a satirist. You can't mark the twain. I thought that was just great. I don't know how true it is. Because of time, I'll just give one more example of the 6,432 that I have. <laughs> it's been a wonderful month, really. I have mentioned my father before. I would have him again. My father was a loving, charming, beautiful, caring family man who was very, very sick. He was one of four people who were very sick in my home with mental illnesses. And it played out in a very, very sick, violent verbally and violent physical way. Jumped to several years later, my first year of teaching, and they had a page in the yearbook where they just had four or five pictures of teachers with the most something, you know, like the students had best smile and most successful and so on. And I was there. I didn't even know that was coming up. I opened the yearbook to see the yearbook. It comes out once a year. And, and, and there was my picture, and it said, the teacher that respects the students the most. I thought, whoa. Yeah. I know. And then I got it the second year. And then I got it the third year, but the yearbook advisor, thank goodness, came up to me and said, you know, you got this the third year, but we can't just keep going this way. <laughs> I said, please, yes, that's fine. Don't uh, give it to, you know, whoever. And then I went to, to the first time to a psychiatrist. And that changed my life. And he asked me, he was very smart, very wise. Oh, I thought, he was 80-something years old, and I thought, oh, I made a mistake. He's so old, he's not going to be able to help me. I'm glad I stuck it out. I turned myself over to him, thank goodness. And he said, what did your students think of you? And I shared this with what I just shared with you. And he said, you know where you got that from, don't you? Your dad, your dad, the effect of your dad gave you an appreciation and a love and an empathy and a degree of compassion. And he said, and I'll tell you something, he was, seemed to be always right. He said, you would not have had that to the degree that you have that. Holy. I think if you got to know Trump's history and Hitler's history, you would say, why aren't they the way they are? Why aren't they? They should be the way they are. Both of their histories are beyond any abuse I suffered. That's a reality to me. And now I don't wake up every morning, eh, maybe one out of three, <laughs> hating a certain political party. 
and a certain leader because I had to find the conflict in here. I'm not going to solve that, and I, damn it, excuse me, I'm not going to spend the next 30 years hating Republicans, hating Trump, Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham. I don't get it. I don't get it. But I had to fix in here. And maybe that's our opportunity. I've carried self-loathing all my life. What a gem. It has motivated me to seek the evidence that proves that I am not worthy of my self-loathing. Could I have done that without the self-loathing? I don't think so. I better end. <laughs> so, I encourage you to seek reality. It's worth it. Thank you. And now uh, we will uh, sing our closing hymn filled with loving kindness. And it was composed by the family spirit who will lead us in song. The words will be up on the screen. Let's let's stay seated as we sing this. so short every time I have to pull a microphone down after. Um, I have a few announcements, some congregational news to share with you. Uh, first of all, uh, for, uh, on Sunday, April 28th, we are going to celebrate the Unitarian Universalist tradition of flower communion. Participants in that day's service will bring in flowers, and we will exchange them with each other, taking home new flowers. So please, please plan to bring a few flowers on that morning. We will have vases and containers, or vases, whichever you prefer. Um, we're hoping for an explosion of color and, kinds, and color and kinds of flowers, but please no lilies. Several of us are allergic to lilies. Looking forward to the beauty. Contact Reverend Ian if you have any questions. Um, this is about the community of UUCOD Facebook. Page. It occurred to me when we had Women's Night Out recently that there were a lot of people around that table that probably are not aware that we have a private Facebook page called the Community of UUCOD. 
So for anyone that's either on Facebook or decide to join Facebook to, to see this page, um, we just wanted to make you aware that, the, that this exists, and it's, this is how it's described on, on the page. This is a closed group of members and known friends of the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Desert. This is our, quote, family dinner table, and as such, quote, what happens here stays here. And when we post on this page, we will follow our Unitarian Universalist Church of the Desert Covenant. And I put a few copies out on the foyer out front, so if you'd like to take that just to see what the covenant is about. Um, we post pictures of our sacred grounds, various events such as Women's Night Out, our social justice events, upcoming free community concerts, labyrinth events, and so much more. So if you'd like to have access, um, there is a handout that Vicki has put out there explaining how to get on the page. It's by invitation only, so you can't just sign up that's why it's, you know, like family. Vicki? Um, I'm sorry, Joey. You can. There's a showing how to join. Okay. You join and you fill out three questions. Okay. And submit it. And then one of the administrators, there are like four or five of us, can automatically bring you into the group. Did everybody hear that? Or? But you can also invite others. Okay. So if you're a member, you can invite others. And if you want to be invited, right. you, you just... Okay, press the join key and put in your information. Okay, those other handouts out front. So we don't want anybody to feel excluded, and we've kind of, you know, lost track of the fact that we got to keep you guys informed, and maybe that might be a good thing for new member classes and orientation. Uh, and finally, I think this is my final notice. Um, as most of you are aware, we have um, a. Uh, rotating art exhibit in the back community room. And somehow I think, oh no, there it is. Um, for the past four months, anyone who has attended a meeting or had other reasons to be in our community room has had the opportunity to, be, to view the beautiful work of our talented artists, Claudia Simmons and Lisa Spencer. They've recently taken down their exhibit and um, over the coming months, it varies depending on, you know, what artists might want to show their work next. You are invited to admire the works of our very own Walter Gindel. Walter, raise your hand so everybody knows the artist. The title of the exhibit is Faces of Guatemala. Faces of Guatemala. Gorgeous, gorgeous portrait photography. It's just breathtaking. His husband actually had Two, two times ago, you had your exhibit in the back, and it was really beautiful. So if you want to uh, consider purchasing anything, you, he's the guy to see, okay? Uh, and if any of you would like to be next in the rotation or consider, and it's, there's no qualifying, it's if you love it and want to show it, we want to see it. So uh, please feel free to contact me. And then, Denise, I think you had an announcement or two? Good morning, news from Social Justice Committee. Uh, today is the last chance to submit your nomination for Share the Plate. Um, the, if you fill one out there, um, plan on having it done before I leave today because I'm taking them all with me. If you want a little more time to think about it, you have until midnight tonight. Uh, go online, you've got a lot of time still. Um, go online or look in last Friday's newsletter for the link. Go online. All you're going to do is sub, uh, fill it out and then hit the submit button. You don't have to do anything else. All electronic. Easy peasy. Uh, the last announcement is, like our community of UUCOD, there is a social justice arm. It is called UUCOD The Vote. And uh, want to get involved in what's going on at UUCOD with social justice, click on that link um, and join it as well. Look forward to seeing you online. Thank you. OK, and now we will extinguish the chalice. Peter, if you come up and extinguish it, and read along with me, the words are on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth. Warm 
You Are There by Erica Zhang. You are there. You have always been there. Even when you thought you were just climbing, you had already arrived. Even when you were breathing hard, you were at rest. Even then, it was clear you were there. Not in our nature to know what is journey and what is arrival. Even if we knew, we wouldn't admit it. Even if we lived, we would think we were just germinating. To live is to be uncertain. Certainty comes at the end. Blessings to all of you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That, that makes-